Thank you. On behalf of the World Affairs Council and the Council on Foreign Relations, I am William Riley, your moderator for this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest. Michael A. Levy is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations and Director of the Council's Program on Energy Security and Climate Change. He's an expert on climate change, energy security, arms control, and nuclear terrorism. Before joining the Council, Dr. Levy was a non-resident science fellow and a science and technology fellow in foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution. And prior to that, he was director of the Federation of American Scientists Strategic Security Project. Dr. Levy holds an MA in physics from Princeton, PhD in war studies from the University of London King's College. He writes far too lucidly and clearly to be a scientist, but he is obviously in a very deep one with an extraordinarily broad background in um, such subjects as um, the Islamic world and technology, which I believe uh, he co-authored the first book on that drew a great deal of attention to that issue and suggests the range of his interest and his knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak about America's energy opportunity, please welcome Michael Levy. In uh, his book, The Power Surge, Energy, Opportunity, and the Battle for America's Future, he begins, you begin, by looking back at the historical patterns which I had never realized were so um, clear of periodic anxiety about America's running out of oil. And the first that he cites took place in 1909. And at 20 year intervals, we have seen similar anxieties raised by serious people with uh, statistics, analysis, and, and strong arguments. The present moment, you argue in the book, is different. What's different about this moment? And if it is different, is this just the trough before we get to another peak of anxiety about peak oil? It's fascinating how we go through these cycles of anxiety about oil shortage and then excitement about abundance. Uh, I actually have a small map sitting in a corner of my office issued by the U.S. Geological Service in 1909 showing all the oil left in the United States. It doesn't cover much of the country and it doesn't cover much of the oil that we've actually developed and exploited over the last hundred years. Right now, we do have this extraordinary period of excitement about American oil abundance. Uh, we've had oil production grow for four straight years after pretty much interminable decline. We had the biggest one-year increase in American oil production uh, last year. And some people will argue that we could see an even larger increase this year. Uh, and so it's important to think about what the world looks like and what the U.S. economy looks like and how we think about the environment in a world where U.S. oil production is rising. But I think it would be unwise to swing far the other way and say we are awash in oil. The, world, the word awash is very popular these days. Frankly, I don't quite want to be awash uh, in oil. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a perfect image. Um, but more to the point, oil is still expensive. I mean, the, the sign of whether we are in a world of abundant oil or scarce oil is the price. And the price is still pretty high, which has consequences for the economy, for security, uh, and beyond. So we are facing less of a picture of scarcity than a lot of people thought five years ago. But I don't think we should be switching to a view where we say oil is everywhere and we don't need to think about it in uh, some of those ways that we did before. And the gas price, while the oil price remains high, is quite low. How do you explain that? So oil is traded on a global market. It's very cheap to move from one place to another. And so when you add production in the United States, it's still diluted in a global market. Uh, in part, uh, U.S. increases are offset by uh, slower growth elsewhere. Uh, you have continuing pressure from rising consumption in the developing world, particularly China, but beyond. And so that all works together to keep oil prices high. Natural gas is a different story. You have uh, fairly balkanized world markets. It's expensive to move gas from one part of the world to another. Uh, if you want to move 
natural gas from the United States to other parts of the world, you have to liquefy it, uh, ship it, and then turn it back into a gas. Uh, that process costs more, uh, considerably more, than extracting the natural gas from the ground in the first place. So we have a pretty isolated market here. Uh, and what that means is that these big increases in U.S. supply for natural gas can translate into substantially lower prices because they're not diluted in the global market and because they're not, the prices aren't pulled up uh, by this very strong demand from overseas. As a result of the increasing supply, both of oil and gas in this country, a huge increase in supply in gas, uh, and a, what appears to be a reasonably steady uh, slowdown in demand, do you foresee uh, significant price reductions? For oil or for gas? For either one. Well, for natural gas, I don't foresee substantial price reductions from where we are today uh, because you still need reasonable prices to create incentives for people to drill. Uh, last year, we saw natural gas prices plunge because people were drilling in uneconomic places. They were drilling because they had leases uh, on properties that they were going to lose unless they put a well in and produced. And that rush to develop uh, led to extremely low prices. And those low prices knocked out additional investment in natural gas, and the number of rigs working in natural gas went way down. Uh, so it's hard for me to see substantially lower prices than today in natural gas. Uh, what we are seeing today is substantially lower prices than we would have otherwise had, mm -hmm. had there not be these strong gains in the United States. Uh, oil is more complicated. If I were a betting person, I would say that we're not going to see radically lower oil prices. I don't think that you can have sustained prices at far lower levels than today on the back of gains in U.S. supply, again, for the same reason, uh, because U.S. supplies are relatively expensive, and if prices are too low, they go away. You can't, use you can't use expensive oil to keep the price low for an extended period. Uh, but the oil market isn't stable. It doesn't move in smooth ways. And I could foresee a situation in the next five years where you have a plunge mm -hmm. for a year or two. And the story would be this. Uh, there are countries around the world, uh, particularly in the Middle East, that make decisions about how much oil to invest uh, based on what they think it will take to keep world prices at a healthy level and to keep their budgets on track. So they want to produce enough and make enough money on each barrel to fund their government budgets. So these are countries like Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or the UAE. Mm -hmm. So they look out at the future and they're trying to decide how much to invest. They see these big gains in Iraq that are a surprise compared to where we think thought things were heading a couple years ago. Uh, they see relatively slow growth in demand compared to where people expected things to be. And at the same time, now they see these big gains coming not only from Canada, but also from the United States. And they have to ask, will these continue? Mm -hmm. In which case we should invest a bit less to make sure that the world market isn't flooded? Uh, or could they taper off? In which case they'll continue to invest more and build their own production capacity. And if they guess wrong, and invest too much, and we invest a lot, and everyone drills too much at the same time, prices have to crash so that demand picks up a bit and so some of that supply gets knocked off. And that works its way through the system and you stop producing as much and prices come back up. But in the interim, you go through quite the roller coaster. And that has consequences for producing countries. It has consequences for consumers. It would have consequences for the various communities in the United States where we're seeing these big oil production increases. What do you see as the uh, implications for the economy, for the environment of the shale boom? It's a huge question. Let's start with the economy. Uh, I think what's happening in shale gas and tight oil happened at a very fortunate time for the U.S. economy. Um, in normal economic conditions, you don't really create jobs through big technological change or booms like this. You move jobs from one part of the economy to another. Uh, when the economy is depressed, these kinds of stimulus can really boost uh, job creation. Uh, on top of that, because we've had lower natural gas prices than we otherwise would, people have more money in their pockets, they're able to spend it. Uh, Peter Orzag, who was head of the Office of Management and Budget uh, for the first part of the Obama administration, describes what's happened in natural gas as possibly akin to a $100 billion tax cut. Uh, and that's a stimulative thing for the economy. Uh, so you have that broad economic implication. Uh, I think that people overstate the long-run economic impacts of what's happening. It's clearly positive. Uh, but when people talk about how you could have 
several million jobs created over the course of the next two decades. I think you've got to put that in context. Uh, over the next few decades, the economy should come back to a more normal state. Frankly, that should happen considerably sooner. And at that point, you're creating wealth, but you're not creating jobs in the same way uh, that, that I think people instinctively, uh, instinctively think. So that's, that's the first piece. The, the second question you asked is, what does this mean for the environment? And you have to separate that into two pieces. I think you have to think about the local environment, and you have to think about climate change and the global environment. Uh, we can talk at great length about what this means for the local environment. Uh, all I'll say at a very simple level is you can do this sort of development well, and you can do it poorly. And if you want, we can talk about the various aspects of, of that distinction. Uh, but at a minimum, even if you do it well, this is intensive industrial development, often in communities that aren't used to it, and you have to manage that integration. Uh, well, you have to manage the way it transforms communities well. Uh, uh, when it comes to the global climate, again, I think you need to think separately about natural gas and about oil. So natural gas is mostly pushing aside coal in power generation right now. Uh, coal entails roughly twice the carbon dioxide emissions that natural gas does. And so you are reducing emissions as a result. We've seen deep reductions in U.S. emissions from a combination of a slower economy, uh, renewable energy penetration, and natural gas displacing coal, uh, particularly last year. Uh, we can, again, talk at some length about that. I don't think that natural gas kills coal in the way that some people uh, think it will. I don't think this is something that miraculously transforms our entire uh, emissions picture. Because uh, the price is now $4 rather than $2 The price is $4 rather than 2 yeah, okay. Right, so last year, last spring, uh, we had natural gas produce as much energy, uh, electricity as coal mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, if you look at the Department of Energy's for so we've now fallen well below that. If you look at the Department of Energy's forecasts, they don't foresee us getting back to the same level of natural gas generation for roughly 10 years if you look at the sort of prices that we expect. Um, so I think natural gas gives you a lower cost option for cutting emissions, but you still have to use policy in order to promote that option. Uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, over the long run, you need to decarbonize the electricity sector. So whether that's renewables or nuclear or capturing the carbon dioxide that comes out of natural gas and coal-fired power plants, you need another side to that natural gas bridge. I think oil is a tougher story on climate change. I don't think you can cook up any argument that says that more oil production is a good thing for climate change. I think what you have to ask is how much climate damage does increased U.S. oil production do? And how does that weigh against the benefits that rising oil production creates? Uh, I said before, when it comes to prices, that I don't expect a huge impact because gains in the United States uh, are likely to be substantially offset by uh, slower growth or cutbacks elsewhere in order to keep prices roughly the same. Uh, but that offset that reduces the price impact also reduces the net climate impact. Uh, because if you're producing less oil somewhere else, and offsetting that with more oil here, the ultimate amount of oil consumption doesn't change uh, that much. Now, you have to go into the numbers to really look at the cost versus the benefits, and I do, uh, I do that in the book. And I come to the conclusion that so long as oil production isn't heavily subsidized, if prices are high, we have net gains when we produce more oil. The analogy I think of sometimes is uh, if you're sick, you want your body to be producing a lot of white blood cells because it means you're fighting that illness. Uh, it doesn't mean that white blood cells are a good thing in and of themselves. You'd, you'd rather not be sick and not having the white blood cells being produced. Uh, there's a similar picture when it comes to oil. We would be better off in the long run with lower oil prices, even if we had less domestic oil production. But as long as oil prices are high, uh, we're in better shape that, given that the economy is responding and technology is responding and giving us more production. The gas uh, boom is considered one of the contributory causes and an important one to the uh, reduction in investment in renewables, certainly in some of, the, some of the places where wind power has been most prominent, like the West, West Texas panhandle. Um, will that ease as the price of gas uh, remains around the $4 level and, or begins to go up again? Or how do you see that playing out? Is it, is it a bad rap against gas to say that it's, uh, it's competing, basically out-competing renewables? I think there's no question that a cheaper alternative option uh, helps reduce investment in other sources, including in wind. Um, 
there are some benefits from natural gas in its ability to fill in for intermittent sources like renewables, uh, like wind. So when the wind isn't blowing, you can fill in with mm -hmm. gas. But it, it does edge them out. The thing I would emphasize is that mm -hmm. if you think about sort of the three big factors, uh, the price of the competition, natural gas, technological change, and policy, the big variable for wind investment and for renewable investment more broadly is still policy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we saw weakness in investment in wind in part because people didn't know what the support of policy would be for wind investment. Again, it, it, don't put too much stock in various projections and models, but if you look at modeling that's been done recently that says what happens if we have substantially higher natural gas prices, mm -hmm. and then says what happens if we cut the cost of renewable energy by 20%, or equivalently support them by 20% through policy, uh, the impact of that, that change in cost or the change in policy is much larger than the impact of a change the in natural gas credit prices. or the renewable portfolio requirements? Well, any of these things can have a similar impact. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not the particular you think they're policy a good idea? choice. Uh, production tax credit or renewable portfolio Either standards? One. I don't love renewable portfolio standards. Uh, I, I think that as a tool for broad decarbonization, you want to put a price broadly on emissions, whether that's through a carbon tax or a cap and trade system or clean energy standard or what have you. The case for, and that levels the playing field and allows all the sources to compete. The case for a renewable portfolio standard uh, is more a, as a technology driver, right? Mm -hmm. There's a case to be made for government helping push technologies out in the marketplace so that they can be improved so that the cost can be brought down and so that they can give us competitive alternatives. Mm -hmm. The problem with the renewable portfolio standard is it lumps together a very diverse set of technologies and doesn't necessarily promote the full range of alternatives the way you would like it to. A renewable portfolio standard is essentially a wind requirement mm -hmm. uh, because wind is the easiest way to fulfill those. I would be more inclined uh, I tend to be more, more favorable toward incentives that are tailored to the various sources. Now, some people will say you're picking winners. Uh, I'd rather design things for particular sources, even if that's called picking winners, than have something that superficially isn't picking winners, like mm -hmm. a renewable portfolio standard, but where we all know pretty much what the winner is going to be. Given your extensive involvement in uh, nuclear energy, do you have an opinion of it? Does it have a future in the country? I think if you had serious carbon policy, nuclear might have a real future mm -hmm. in the country because its big advantage is that it doesn't generate carbon dioxide emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, it generates them in the construction, and, and those aren't trivial, mm -hmm. but in operation, it doesn't. Right now, nuclear is not cost competitive. It, it wasn't particularly cost competitive uh, in most parts of the country and for most, op uh, for most people doing investing before natural gas prices went way down. Mm -hmm. And cheap natural gas has made it even tougher for nuclear to compete. And one of the things I do worry about is that as some of these nuclear power plants come up for relicensing or for safety upgrades, uh, they're finding it unprofitable even to invest yeah. in the safety upgrades in order to continue operating because of the competition yeah. from cheap gas, which cuts their daytime prices, and from subsidized wind, which cuts their nighttime revenues. And so they're shutting down, and that actually increases our, our emissions. So I'd like to see us uh, create a level playing field that allows nuclear to compete. Then we would have to deal with our waste disposal challenge and our safety challenges. I, I think now might be a good moment to be doing more about those mm -hmm. because it wouldn't happen in, be happening in the context of a whole bunch of impending nuclear construction. Former chairman of Exelon, the largest nuclear company, has estimated it would take $8 gas and a $25 per ton carbon price for nuclear to have a chance. Is that, which neither one looks very likely in the near term. No, no, neither looks likely in the near term. Yeah. Uh, you could still imagine over a 20-year period, uh, maybe slightly cheaper natural gas than that and a slightly higher carbon price in one form or another, right? Mm -hmm. There are different ways to price, uh, to price carbon. It doesn't only have to be through a, an explicit carbon tax. Let's talk for a minute about uh, the negative impacts alleged to be associated, not just alleged, but found to be associated in some parts of the country with the shale gas boom, particularly in New York, where the governor has... Uh, banned it in many parts of the state in response to local concerns. Uh, Pennsylvania also, where there have been uh, residual um, chemicals that deposited in inappropriate places without any kind of treatment. Uh, arguments about contamination of the water supply and the aquifers and so forth. Um, where, do you think it's worth it? 
Or do you I, think, I think, you think it's worth it if you do it properly. Uh -huh. And I think we ought to make sure we focus on the main risks. Uh, it turns out that some of the most telegenic risks are not the biggest ones. So you can light your tap water and fire in a lot of places where there's gas telegenic development happening. Risk. The phrase I've never heard. <laughs> It's like a charismatic megaspecies or megafauna. I don't think okay. I've ever used that phrase before. Maybe I'll, I'll try it's, it again. Well, it's good. Um, <laughs> you heard it, invented here. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, what makes for good TV isn't necessarily what you need to focus on. And with limited regulatory capacity, you need to focus on the things that are actual problems. So I tend to classify them in three main parts. The first is water risks, uh, and particularly risks associated not with what goes into the ground, but with what comes out and how you dispose of it. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, two days ago, the governor of Illinois signed what are broadly seen to be the nation's toughest rules on fracking into law. And mm -hmm. they're supported by industry in part because industry realized that the alternative was a moratorium, mm -hmm. like in New York State. Uh, and they're supported by a large range of environmental groups because they are genuinely tough. And one of the highlights of the rules is that wastewater, uh, before it's processed and disposed of, has to be stored in above ground tanks rather than in some of these pools that are built into, into the ground. If we hadn't come to an understanding that the big water risk is less what you put in, though you have to be careful about that, than what comes out, you wouldn't have been able to have this tank approach as a way for industry and environmental groups to agree on going forward. So, Understanding what the actual risks are does help us pursue the right policies. Uh, the second piece is air. Uh, and in particular, if you use diesel generators to operate facilities, uh, you get air pollution. If you, allow, uh, if you allow methane and other components of natural gas to leak out of your equipment, uh, those are often ozone precursors, and you have air problems. And you can think about this on a well-by-well -well basis or rig-by-rig -rig basis, and the impact might be small, but the cumulative impact of a lot of development can be large. And so I think we're seeing good rules come down, in this case from Washington, on uh, green completions, making sure that you don't have the same kind of uh, air impacts that you might have had in the earlier days. I think we ought to figure out ways to go further on the diesel generator side. There happens to be a lot of a clean fuel you can use to power generators around these places. It's mm -hmm. natural gas. Uh, the third piece is not a traditional environmental issue. It's the community impacts of what happens. Uh, if you think about what happens in a lot of these places where development hits, you take one slice of people who get very rich very quickly. Another segment that does all right because they're either working on the industry or they've got a hotel or a restaurant or some other way that they're benefiting. There's a third segment that either is or feels threatened um, because of the reputation to the area, let's say they're in the food business, uh, or uh, they're on fixed incomes. And a lot of these places are afraid of uh, a boom and then a bust, and so they're not investing in new housing and new, uh, and new uh, infrastructure, and so you have a lot of cost inflation. And those mm -hmm. people end up getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that you integrate development properly with the communities, whether that's having the right severance tax so you have revenues that help the community more broadly, whether it's having community college courses so that not all of the high-skilled employment comes from out of state. I mean, these are not easy things. You don't just have a rule in Washington mm -hmm. that says, here's how you do it. Uh, this is one where each community and each state needs to learn from the experience and the others. So the industrialization of the countryside is just uh, an inevitable byproduct. All the trucks that are going to be hauling the water in and the, and the fuels out. Um, and uh, that's got to be accepted, but there's, you, you can adapt the system so that the methane releases that have been a concern are controlled for and, and the water as well, I would assume. Well, so I would uh, say two things on, on that. So first, there are some steps you can take to reduce the truck traffic and, and, and to reduce the number of excess wells. A lot of this still is fairly blind. Mm -hmm. If we had better understanding of the subsurface, if we had uh, more integrated water infrastructure, we could drill fewer uneconomic and environmentally problematic wells mm -hmm. and, reduce, and reduce water flows. And more broadly, and this is a place where, where I continue to be ambivalent, um, my inclination is that a lot of the decision making should rest at the local level. Uh, 
Really? Um, you'd, you'd leave it at local options? At a fairly local level. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you spend time in these places where people are fighting over what's happening, I think it's hard to say that someone in a distant place should say, the, play, the, the area where you live uh, must be transformed because someone wants mm -hmm. to make money producing natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, now, the argument that's, you hear that's from... That's even acknowledging that we've got subsurface ownership rights in, in the country. Right, so... So, uh, so well, the fellow that owns the, the shale gas in a community where right. that's not popular uh, right, doesn't, so doesn't get to do it. That's my, that's my inclination. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, in New York State, what we've talked about is having a 60% threshold mm -hmm. for uh, one way or the other, either you're in or you're out. The argument you hear from industry is that if you do this, you'll create a checkerboard of sort of red lights and green lights that make it uneconomic to develop anything. And in a, in, in a sense, uh, one area saying no would be making a decision for another area um, uh, a spillover decision for them. I would actually love to see better analysis. I don't think we have good analysis of how these kinds of decisions would actually change the economics of the industry. And I'd like to see uh, better analysis of that. I think we could make better decisions on this balance between local and state control. Well, you mentioned uh, a minute ago that uh, you didn't see that there were any environmental advantages that were obvious from an increase in oil production or oil supplies. So you're probably against the XL pipeline. I am not against the XL pipeline um, because the world isn't just about climate change. And climate change is an extraordinarily important problem, but you have to consider climate in the context of economic goals and security goals and international relationships. I wish the XL pipeline had not become such a signature issue for our debate over climate change. I think the climate impacts are small. The economic impacts are small as well. The security impacts are small. I've testified that I think that the benefits uh, of allowing it to go forward likely outweigh the cost, but I don't think any of those are particularly large. And it bothers me that uh, we've had this uh, debate that, uh, in some ways, analysis follows advocacy. Uh, people stake out positions. They want to strengthen those positions, and uh, they continue to drive analysis behind that. So you hear that this will free us from Middle Eastern oil, or that it will be game over for climate change, and none of those things have foundation in reality. What will happen to the uh, tar sands, the oil sands, if the XL pipeline is not approved? What's so you, your, you what's use your both prediction? approved names for, uh, the, for the resource. I know someone who tried to rebrand them the bitumen sands. That, did not, <laughs> that didn't go anywhere. Um, it's actually, as best I understand it, Canada has always called it oil sands. The United States has always called its own resource tar sands. So it's been turned into this label. No, I hit both of them, didn't it I? Tells you, uh, it tells you what you believe. So where will they go if uh, the Keystone XL pipeline is not allowed? Mm -hmm. We're seeing some coming to the United States by rail. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing some being moved out to, uh, out to the West Coast uh, near Vancouver. I still think that if we were to block the Keystone Pipeline and block a series of other pipelines, because this is not the only pipeline project people are pursuing, mm -hmm. um, even right now, uh, that we would ultimately see this get out somehow from Canada. Right now, it is not worth the political price for the Canadian federal government to push this through British Columbia over the objections of some uh, First Nations groups and of a lot of British Columbia voters uh, because they think it can get out through the United States. Um, it's not worth it to the companies involved to pay large sums in order to placate people who would be along the route, and, uh, the various routes, in order to get this out through the West Coast. If the resource were trapped in Canada by U.S. decisions and so the choice for these companies and for politicians would be between nothing and paying a price to get it out. I think they would take very different steps from what we're seeing right now. I think the other thing to keep in mind, and this goes back again to the dynamic I talked about, where when the United States increases production, others tend to cut back to stabilize prices. It's the same thing applies in Canada. That's why when you get the contractor reports out about the pipeline, they say even if you allow it, it'll barely reduce oil prices. That's because there's an assumption that increased Canadian production will be offset by lower than otherwise production elsewhere. But that same dynamic also means that the emissions are largely offset. Mm -hmm. There is an argument that uh, just keeping the pipeline from being constructed raises the price $2 a barrel of the oil up there simply because it's a lot more expensive yes. to get it out and uh, right. the bidding for it is different. Let me ask a related question. The uh, several communities in Oregon and Washington are strongly opposed to exports yeah. of natural gas and, of course, coal, coal. Um, for the impacts they would have on the local right. community, as well as for broader climate right. concerns. Right. 
And Senator Wyden, the chairman of the Energy Committee, is, is sympathetic to those yes. objectives. Senator uh, Wyden of Oregon. Yes, of Oregon. Yes, I should have said that. Uh, do you have an opinion on um, how that should be resolved, and would you leave that decision to local option? So uh, first, let me just say a quick word about this $2 increment. So if you blocked it and you got a $2 increase in prices, if, the, if Canadian oil is the marginal barrel of oil on the world market, and you have a $2 price increase. That's a $2 price increase on every barrel of oil that the United States imports. That actually adds up to a very large price for a small emissions reduction. That's part of why when you do the, the math on this, it's hard to come to the conclusion that the benefits of blocking the pipeline outweigh the, the costs. On the export question, uh, natural gas exports, you have arguments on both sides. Uh, I think the central economic debate, would we be better off if we allowed exports um, with the increased revenue from production and from exporting and decreased revenue in some energy intensive industries? I think if you do the math, it's pretty straightforward that we have economic gains from exports. And the other, uh, but, but prices small. Prices of 14 to $17 million cubic feet uh, Overseas, in Japan so, and Australia and so forth. Though I don't think we would capture a lot of that. The way that these terminals are likely to operate uh, are basically terminal operators providing liquefaction services. Mm -hmm. So someone buys the gas, delivers it to the terminal, they pay for the liquefaction, then it's taken away. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had terminal operators basically buying the gas, liquefying and then selling it themselves at the overseas price, they would never find a banker to support them. Uh, the banker would be taking a risk on U.S. prices, construction costs, and overseas prices. Um, so I, I just, I don't think that's what's likely to... Even at that largest spread? Four, even at that Four to 14 or four to Four to 17. 14 and take away $7 maybe mm -hmm. for transportation right. and maybe a little bit more and mm -hmm. let the prices move together a bit and mm -hmm. all of a sudden your money is gone. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to find someone to run your company who understands global gas markets and building, building plants and U.S. gas. I, I just think it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so far, we are just seeing this other, this other model. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the net economic gains are that large. Uh, the, the estimates I've done add up to a few billion dollars a year. So, so it's not, not, not world changing. No big deal to say no to it. So economics is the first piece. Okay. The second piece is geopolitics. We still benefit from an open global trading system. Mm -hmm. We benefit not only in the energy area, but more broadly. Uh, we have successfully sued China, the World Trade Organization, to stop it from putting restrictions on its raw materials exports. We're in the process of getting it to reduce its restrictions on rare earths exports. Uh, they say that they're doing it for environmental reasons. They quietly say they're doing it for competitiveness reasons. We would be doing it for those exact same reasons. We would be writing their brief mm -hmm. if we turned around and did the same thing on U.S. natural gas. Uh, but, and to me, that's a powerful reason for allowing these to go forward. Mm -hmm. And I think you've heard this from the administration as well. Uh, there's been uh, strong statements, not just from the National Security Advisor, but from the President himself, about the geopolitical importance of what's happening in natural gas. But there are downsides. Uh, and the two that stand out to me are, first, that you will see a, a small, I don't think a huge increase in U.S. prices, because there's just a natural limit. If prices go too high, you uh, are no longer competitive in global markets, and so you price yourself out. Um, but you have an increase that's not trivial for low-income consumers in particular. Uh, if you have a $1 increase in the price of 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas, that's about 50 bucks on the uh, annual energy bill of uh, someone in the lowest tenth of the income range, that's a non-trivial increase. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure we keep in place programs that help people absorb those higher heating costs like the low income uh, home energy assistance program. The second piece is uh, the reason that this is economically beneficial is because it creates a stimulus for more natural gas production. And more natural gas production means a spreading of the environmental risks that are associated with production. Uh, I think that the growth of natural gas exports is yet another reason to make sure that we get the rules right for, uh, for natural gas production. And, and I think that this is uh, particularly true as a message for industry. Um, if there is any more potent message than uh, we don't want you to pollute our drinking water, it's we don't want you to pollute our drinking water to send something to China. Do you discount the possibility that the natural gas that we might export would displace coal and therefore improve the climate in other countries? I don't think it's a particularly large impact. So if we export natural gas, the price goes up a bit here, and we use more coal and less gas. So that's a negative climate impact. 
Um, but if natural gas replaces coal abroad, that's a positive impact. Uh, if it replaces nuclear abroad in Japan, it's not. So it's a complicated picture. I just don't think it's a big impact one way or the other. And it doesn't seem to me like a central consideration in making a decision on mm -hmm. uh, liquefied natural gas exports. It's also a mixed picture at home, by the way. If you stiffen prices a bit, that helps uh, renewable energy uh, make gains, though I don't think that offsets uh, what would happen in coal. Mm -hmm. So your feeling is that in either case, coal or gas, we should not, for those uh, trade reasons largely, I obstruct their export. I haven't talked about coal yet. I'm ambivalent on coal exports. Um, sounded like your thesis is pretty much, though, if it's, if it's a trade kind of concern, it applies to it, doesn't it? If there are local concerns around coal exports, then I think those need to be taken into consideration. Uh, I would be wary of blocking coal exports as an instrument of climate policy. Mm -hmm. Again, because first, I am wary of what it does to broader trade uh, arrangements. And also because the studies I'm starting to see, and I think we'll see some more firm work in the not too distant future, the studies I'm starting to see say that US coal exports mostly displace other sources of coal rather than adding to global mm -hmm. uh, coal consumption. This is consistently an important question. Does additional US supply replace another source, in which case the net impact on climate is neutral, or does it add to other sources well, in which surprising case it's reality to many of us is that a lot of the coal has been going to Europe. That's right. And That's if you uh, ask people in Europe, they say they would have got it from, uh, from somewhere else instead. Right. <laughs> I've got several questions here uh, about nuclear. I think we kind of covered nuclear. Um, four questions about nuclear. Um, if, uh, if there's anything more to be said about it, uh, you want to say it? <laughs> uh, moving, moving beyond that, um, this really, this is kind of the core question, I, I think, for you, and it's uh, very uh, directly addressed in your book. What has to happen for U.S. politicians to come together and create an effective energy policy? How do, how do you draw all of these strands together? So what I think you don't do is come up with a grand national energy plan, uh, or at least you don't try to, because if you try to, you end up not getting it. Uh, and the first thing you need is a basic understanding of what should be tolerable to each side. I don't think you ask for people to get to a place where they all agree on all of our objectives and on exactly what they want. Um, but if we got to a point where you know, the natural gas industry understood that climate policy would be good for them because it would increase production and if uh, it increased demand for their product, um, or if people focused on reducing oil consumption understood that a trade that increased production and pursued more aggressive policy on consumption would still be a net positive for them, for security, for the economy, and for climate change. I think if people understand that those trades are actually substantively possible, that's the first step. Uh, the second thing I think needs to happen is we need to uh, gain some more experience in cooperating. I mean, uh, you were involved in, uh, in a lot of efforts to bring together people over, uh, not just over the last decade, but, uh, but past that. Um, in the last decade, if you go back 10 years, people actually started to do some of these things together. 2005, 2007, we had bipartisan energy mm -hmm. legislation. In 2008, the two presidential candidates fought over whose cap and trade system was better. That would be kind of a wild thing to have happen today. Um, so I think we need to... Uh, we we're had the United States Climate Action Plan, which fell apart. Right. Partnership. So a lot fell apart. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, encountered pretty rough circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need to build up that habit of cooperation from the ground up. Uh, I talk about a few different ways you could do that in the book. One of the ones that I find interesting is a variation on what the president has proposed as an energy security trust, where you would take some of the money from increased leasing for oil and gas and devote it to supporting technological innovation in alternatives to oil and reduced oil consumption. What I found extraordinarily frustrating with the reception to that is, again, people have fixated on whatever the downside of that deal is to them, mm -hmm. rather than on the upside. So you see, I'll just give one example, you see the Heritage Foundation, which has talked for years about how extraordinarily transformational oil and gas production would be for the United States. Now saying that if revenues from that increased production are used to spend 200 million bucks a year on innovation, it's not worth it, because that's a waste of government money. I mean, if something is radically transformational, it should be worth it even if you take that $200 million and you burn it in a fire somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, you, can run the argument, uh, you can run the argument the other way. For people who are so enthusiastic about innovation, and all of a sudden they'll say, well, it's not worth it if we're going to have a little more oil production. I mean, people would do better if they focused on the net 
value to them rather than on making sure that every piece of a deal was exactly what they wanted. Are you uh, a supporter of, of the various investments that the uh, Obama administration has made in energy innovation, energy research, energy uh, uh, new electric vehicles and so forth? I think it's been a mixed record. Uh, so firstly, I'll say again, I'm worried that even some of the areas where there's broad agreement that they have been successful are becoming targets for political fights. So uh, ARPA-E, this uh, mm -hmm. Advanced uh, Energy Research Projects Agency that looks at early stage, uh, fairly high risk uh, investment supported not only by the president, by, but by Governor Romney during the campaign last year, mm -hmm. uh, funding slashed uh, by the House. I don't think it'll end up like that, but slashed mm -hmm. in principle uh, during the last week. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not the kind of place we should be going after. I do think that combining the stimulus with the big green energy push uh, in some places was uh, not the thing that should have been done. Uh, try, the goal of trying to get money out as fast as you possibly can is not uh, compatible uh, a lot of the time with trying to drive the changes that you want in the energy world. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hope we can step back and rationalize some of this. What I would like to see, uh, though I'm not particularly optimistic for it in Washington, is some kind of an independent uh, organization. Some people will call it a green bank, but you can uh, think of it a different way, in different ways that has some independent governance, that it has its own capital, and that can invest in a variety of different ways uh, that are appropriate to the technologies being pursued. One of the problems we've had is that we have one tool, loan guarantees, that we try to use for pretty much everything, even though even if the uh, you know, company or technology developer mm -hmm. involved does not need a loan guarantee. Maybe needs some equity, maybe needs a different kind of support. Uh, so I'd like to see us uh, be more flexible. We're seeing uh, something along those lines being uh, tried out in Connecticut. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Mm -hmm. We may be awash in oil. Uh, do you ever foresee a day when we, the USA, becomes totally independent for its energy without the use of so much oil? So we are seeing these colliding trends of less oil consumption, more oil production. Uh, I, think I think a lot of, despite the headlines that focus only on production, we've had as big of a decline in oil consumption since 2005 as we have had an increase in oil production since oil mm -hmm. bottomed out in 2009, so, uh, or 2008. So we're seeing both of those trends coming together. I find it hard in the next 10 or 20 years to imagine the United States producing all the oil it consumes, even if you pull those two trends together. Uh, I think that eventually that could happen. And I think that in the next 10 years, and you've seen projections to this effect, that North America could produce all the oil that it consumes through a combination of less use and more production. Uh, what I don't like about the discussion we're having about that is that we keep calling this energy independence uh, when it wouldn't actually produce independence in a meaningful sense. Uh, we would still be vulnerable to shocks that arise from events on the other side of the world our economy would still be hurt, and so we would still think about the consequences of actions everywhere because of how they would hit our economy. Uh, that, to me, is not independence. And so uh, I'm wary of, of talking about it uh, that way. I think in the long run, you have to severely cut your oil consumption in order to really make yourself more resilient to these gyrations in global markets, whether they're from economic sources or from geopolitical forces. It seems to me there's a scenario where we continue to find shale gas and co-located liquids. Europe eventually figures out how, how to do it too, at least Eastern Europe. Uh, we know Russia has a substantial amount of shale uh, possibility. Um, China has it. Argentina has a, some very near, near our quality, a great deal of it. Mexico has it, and now the new president of Mexico is looking to privatize and to do something about the fact that their energy company has not been very productive or efficient. Um, but if you, in Canada, of course, is, is, is a big player. If you see that supply uh, surge coming on worldwide as other countries figure out, and we're teaching them how to do it to, to get the shale gas, um, and then you posit the United States with the, with the new um, 54.5 mile per gallon uh, fuel efficiency requirement the Obama administration has negotiated, we're going to have a 2.25 million barrel per day reduction in demand. Europe's going the same way. If China begins to get, not independent, but to produce more of its own requirements, that will reduce import. That, aren't we going to see a decline in, in um, price and um, a significant change in the, in the energy economy worldwide, at least so the oil economy? Well, so gas would have to 
penetrate the transport world, the world that's traditionally dominated by oil, in a big way for that to happen, right? You see these large and principal shale resources in China. Well, why would it, though? Because oil is coming up with it. And we've already seen an increase in our oil production as well. We've seen an increase in our oil production, uh, though more from, uh, increasingly more from tight oil. It's not just co-located with natural gas, but it's mm -hmm. its own oil production. I think we're barely starting to understand the oil potential in the rest of the world that uh, can be unlocked through these techniques. We saw a Department of Energy report last week mm -hmm. that I think uh, says the U.S. is in a more uh, unusual position when it comes to oil, though others are still, uh, are still producing. Uh, so the question is, why won't we have ultra-low prices at some point because of this? Again, the problem is that this is relatively expensive stuff to produce. Mm -hmm. And you cannot sustain low prices with expensive production. Uh, you had an episode in the 1980s where you essentially did do that uh, because a lot of companies went and spent a ton of money uh, on the assumption that prices would be very high. Once they built their facilities, uh, they could produce for a very small incremental cost. So even when prices plunged, they continued to produce, and you had a hangover for 10, 15 years of very low oil prices. I don't think you have that same dynamic today. Uh, because these wells uh, have very high production initially and then decline rapidly. And what that means is that if prices fall, investment stops, and production starts to tail off and brings the market back into balance. So I think you could see a shift in the geography of oil production. Mm -hmm. But I think that's much more likely than a fundamental shift in prices in the broader course of uh, how we use energy as a result. And now, the question is, the question that that spar spurs is, what would that change in the geography of oil production mean for international relations? An economist will tell you that where oil is produced doesn't matter all that much because oil is a fungible commodity. It can be traded globally. Price moves in tandem. And that's true. Uh, I did a... I ran a study with a colleague of mine a couple years ago where we wanted to ask a different question. We asked not uh, should oil influence international politics, because again, an economist will tell you it shouldn't, but does it inf influence international politics? What is the record? And we brought together uh, 12 different scholars who looked at pairs of countries. And one of the big things we found is that oil trade patterns influence international relations because leaders think that they should. So if leaders believe that it matters, that they get their oil from country A instead of country B, then a shift in the patterns of oil trade will affect their attitudes toward the world. When I traveled in the Middle East, when I was writing the book, uh, one of the things I heard from people was, uh, in all seriousness, you're here to steal the oil, and if you don't need to steal the oil anymore, presumably you won't be here. Hmm. When you talk to people in China, there is a real fear that the United States will no longer police the sea lanes that allow it to buy oil from the Middle East. And again, uh, the National Security Advisor and the Assistant Secretary of State for Energy can all go out and give speeches saying, we're in it for good, we're going to keep the sea lanes open, we're going to try and promote stability in the Middle East. Uh, but if others don't believe that because of the shifting geography of oil production... Then they invest in aircraft then carriers. Then they invest in air... Exactly. They invest in aircraft carriers and in diplomatic relationships and in economic mm -hmm. ties to solidify those, and they have a life of their own. Mm -hmm. regardless of that underlying logic. Well, then let me ask you here, what is the relationship between our national energy policy and national security? It's a short question with huge implications. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very terse question. <laughs> there are a lot of different pieces to the, re the relationship, everything from how our energy policy affects climate change, which has its own national security consequences, to what it means to shift to clean energy sources that have their own resource dependencies on things like lithium and cobalt and rare earths, and I talk about a lot of that um, in the book. Let me talk about something that we haven't discussed yet, and that is the geopolitical, mm -hmm. geopolitical consequences we've already seen from what's happening in natural gas. We have this fixation on a debate over exports, but the biggest impact from abundant U.S. natural gas is something we've already seen. It's that we're not importing it. A lot of countries, Qatar in particular, built up production capacity and export capacity with the expectation that they would be supplying the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. And when the United States went from having 60-plus plants with applications to import natural gas to very little natural gas imports except in some parts of the country where you can't build infrastructure, uh, particularly Massachusetts, uh, you had these countries having to decide what to do with their natural gas. 
one of the things they did was put a lot of it into Europe. And particularly, they put it into places where natural gas could be freely traded. Um, so that uh, different sources of gas from Norway, from the UK, from the Middle East in this case, could be competing against each other and transparently setting a price that then consumers could pay. Now, why does that matter? That matters because historically, natural gas has not been traded that way. Uh, the price is set in an opaque way based on political negotiations that link natural gas prices to the price of oil. And because those negotiations are opaque and because it's not clear exactly how you should link it, politics is always involved. That's why you had these cutoffs of natural gas from Russia into Europe on various occasions in the 2000s. Those were ostensibly fights over pricing formulas. Sounds like the most boring thing ever, but they were exercises of power. You haven't seen that in the last few years. Instead, you've seen Europeans demand to Gazprom, to Russian companies, that they price more of their gas in this freely traded, open, transparent way that removes a lot of the politics from it. And these European companies have been succeeding. And so you're seeing a shift in the balance of power in these markets and the relationship between Europe and Russia there. That's already a huge impact that what's happened in US natural gas has had for the rest of the world. There's an open question of whether we'll see that happen in Asia. I think there are some much larger barriers to having that kind of transformation in Asia. The um, ExxonMobil future analysis of supply and demand concludes that there will be a very small percentage of supply provided by renewables in the year 2030. Do you agree with that? The ExxonMobil projections are based on business as usual and political business as usual as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if we pursue political business as usual, then I think it's quite reasonable to expect that a pretty small fraction of our energy will be provided by renewable sources. We're not going to get a competitive sources. break for They're going to get maybe new batteries. We, maybe and we will. And if when people ask me, what is the fracking of the next 10 years? What's the technology mm -hmm. that could turn all the assumptions upside down? It's some kind of storage technology mm -hmm. that would change the economics of renewable energy or electric cars or both mm -hmm. of them. Um, a lot of people working on it. A lot of people working on it and totally possible for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And we have to be uh, you know, modest about our expectations mm -hmm. for the future. But I wouldn't bet on knowing that we'll see a big penetration without policy changes. I do think that with policy changes, you could see uh, significant penetration with cost-effective policy changes um, to, again, to level the playing field and to promote greater innovation. I, I find these exercises that you see, uh, whether it's from the Department of Energy or ExxonMobil, that look at these futures, I find them useful, they're informative, but they can be badly misused. Mm -hmm. When they're used as a tool to tell you, here is what the future will be, get used to it and figure out how to live with it, I think they're dangerous. Uh, because they're one snapshot of one way that things can go. Well, the energy companies aren't putting all their eggs in those baskets. We know that they apply a virtual, a virtual charge to uh, uh, basically a, a surrogate tax yes. to a barrel of oil. I think Shell's is $75, ConocoPhillips is $25. So uh, they are anticipating that there could be a carbon impact or carbon cost. So it's interesting. Uh, a variety of these companies are putting these prices on in their own planning. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're not looking at is what the cumulative impact would be if the whole world were doing this. Because uh, what they're looking at is essentially the differential impact on different barrels of oil. Uh, if the whole world were pursuing a very strong carbon policy, what you would see over time is a decline in the price of oil. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that's being factored into these various estimates. So what they're basically looking at is a world, and this is not an implausible world, a world where Western countries in particular and the countries where they're investing put this price on, mm -hmm. but where it's not globalized yet. Mm -hmm. An interesting question here. What's the most unexpected thing you learned during your research? Much of the book focuses on how energy choices play out at the local level. Do you have a favorite story? Actually, I'm, I can think of one, but it's not fit for a family <laughs> audience. It's really, uh, I recommend it. It's Mr. Mr. Bix? Mr. Dix. Mr. Dix. Yes, yes this I, book has more swearing in it than anything ever <laughs> produced by a Council on Foreign Relations scholar. Um, <laughs> how's, that for a, how's that for a sales pitch? Um, you know, the, but that cluster of, of stories really, uh, and stories and meetings and people who I encountered when I was writing the book, I think is the one that, stays with me. I've spent some time in southern Ohio when I was writing the book. And I tell the story of these two gentlemen, old friends, Warren Taylor, Bill Dix, who are very much uh, in line ideologically and opposed on hydraulic fracturing and development in the area, in part to help people understand that there are legitimate concerns on both sides of this 
uh, debate. It's part of what made me more sympathetic to uh, these local uh, concerns. But I only put part of that in the, uh, I only was able to fit part of that in the book. I spent time uh, with a couple while they sort of discovered that they disagreed on whether they should lease their land. And that's oh, a tough, that's why, a tough fight. Why, I, I spend, while you're on the subject, one, one uh, questioner asked, uh, you are pretty sympathetic to local concerns. Is that because of the threat of lawsuits or because of altruistic reasons? It sounds like it well, might I, I have to no, do with some uh, experience. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't think I could get hit with any lawsuits. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's both. I, look, I think it's important to do right by people mm -hmm. and to do things safely. But I also think it's important to explain to people in industry that even if they're not focused on that, and a lot of people are, even if they're not, it's important for their bottom line that they do things in a way that allows them sustained access and opportunities for production. So you can talk about both of those at the same time. Let me say, I, I'm, you know, I met with this couple. I met with a group of farmers who were underwater and were all really hoping that the companies would come and lease their land. Uh, they knew I was going to see some people from a gas company the next day. I got a call, uh, or a colleague of mine who I was with got a call uh, the next evening. Did you talk to them? Are they coming? Are they going to invest in our land? And they, this is really, this is make or break for a lot yeah. of these people. And, it, and that, that really drives it home. I'll tell you the other piece of the, the sort of the wandering that I did that I really enjoyed, uh, and this, I'll, I'll, betray my, I'll betray my interest, was not only through the United States, but also uh, trying to understand what we really know about energy, trying to understand what we figured out in the four decades since the first oil crisis about how bad price spikes actually are for the economy, mm -hmm. trying to understand how oil trade really does affect international relationships. I mean, those are sort of virtual tours of, of things, but, but I find those fascinating as well. Will Arctic resources make any difference to the uh, energy economy? I think in the short run, uh, and you know this better than I do, we're seeing significant uh, challenges for Arctic development. Um, and I think when in applying prudent environmental rules, we're finding that companies can't move at the pace that they would have, have liked to. And that's fine. If we can't comply with the right rules, we're, uh, we shouldn't be going mm -hmm. uh, gung-ho ahead. I think over time, if prices stay high, uh, you're going to see increased development in, uh, in the Arctic. And frankly, as Arctic ice melts and makes uh, development more economic uh, in the area. Uh, this is one of these sort of uh, awful ironies of what's happening with climate change. Uh, the one thing I'd say is, in some ways, what's happening helps diffuse the traditional Arctic fight, which is over the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. It's still symbolic, mm -hmm. but now there are so many different places you can imagine doing development, given that prices are high, not just in the Arctic, but elsewhere, that there may not be so much pressure on trying to fight over the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. My own sense the, is, the, the is consistent with that, that uh, there is so much opportunity in the lower 48, and it is very expensive and very difficult and challenging right. to develop, certainly the offshore Arctic, that um, I don't expect it will be a priority. It hasn't been a priority for too many companies. And the one company that really was the pioneer has gotten badly burned. Right. Um, carbon sequestration, is it um, a serious possibility? I think it is. I don't think it's ready yet at the price that we would want it. Let me say two basic things about it. First, carbon sequestration. So you can imagine a world where you have breakthroughs on renewable energy that mm -hmm. make it cost competitive or cheaper than uh, at least uh, new fossil fuel generation, though it, it's very tough to compete with already existing generation. Uh, you can imagine the same for nuclear, big transformations that change the cost equation. Carbon capture and sequestration is a cost, pure. Mm -hmm. uh, it only happens when you have some sort, at scale, uh, with the exception of enhanced oil recovery, when you have some sort of policy framework in place that incentivizes uh, efforts that reduce emissions. So that's the first thing. If we don't have that, we're not going to see mass deployment of carbon capture and sequestration. I think we need to get more projects out there to learn not just the technology. We know all the pieces, but how you integrate it and how you make the businesses mm -hmm. work. You have to integrate power plants and pipelines and storage. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting about what's happening in natural gas is it may give us a new opportunity to experiment with carbon capture and sequestration. One of the big problems with carbon capture and sequestration for coal is that you had to do these enormous projects big risks, big costs. Uh, if government was going to support them, you couldn't spread your bets much. With natural gas, you can actually do a lot of smaller projects at the same cost. Uh, that might be a better opportunity to learn from experience, to innovate, to uh, develop and bring the technology a bit down the cost curve so that it be can become 
uh, more valuable. But I'll say broadly, I think we need to be encouraging progress in renewables, nuclear, and carbon capture and sequestration precisely because we're bad at predicting the future and we know we're going to need zero carbon options. Final question, Michael. We're running out of time. Um, what is in it for an environmentalist? What's in it for an oil industry executive to cooperate with the other in coming together as you suggest? If you have a future, at least for the next 10 or 20 years, where you have higher oil production, higher natural gas production, lower oil consumption, lower greenhouse gas emissions, and greater penetration of renewables, then there's something in it for each of these players. If they're focused only on what the other side gets, then, of course, they should be against it. And I'll say in the long run, to be very clear, mm -hmm. in the long run, if you're really slashing emissions, that does fundamentally change the picture mm -hmm. uh, for fossil fuels. And, and it does fundamentally change the picture for oil. But if you're looking at the coming decades, it, these pieces really are compatible with each other if you pursue them in, uh, in the right way. But what would be in it for the various sides would be the willingness of the other to give them a bit more of what they want. Mm -hmm. All right. On that note, good luck with that, by the way. <laughs> I want to thank you very much on behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations for uh, really a splendid conversation and a, and a very good book, which I understand is uh, available. Um, where is it? Ah, okay, I can't see it. Uh, and uh, I strongly recommend it. It's, um, it's, it's a, remarkable, a remarkably confident book about America's prospects at this moment as a consequence of uh, things that most often are reported as divisive and contentious when the particular local stories emerge. This is a big picture book, and it's by a big picture guy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.